Thanks to be here in China. We're wrapping up the program now, uh, our final uh, morning of activity here in Shanghai, uh, a visit that has been uh, incredibly warm and constructive. Uh, the message that New Zealand is open for business has been well received here in China. Uh, and I think we have the opportunity today to see uh, just how thriving uh, the business relationship between New Zealand and China is, the opportunity to see um, some New Zealand product on display, uh, to sample a little bit, a little bit of it as well, um, and to uh, continue with the, you know, the networking opportunities this morning, um, particularly building on a very successful event last night, which had hundreds um, of local and New Zealand business people able to get together. Um, I thought before we open up for questions, I'm going to hand over to the head of our business delegation, Jamie, to give you a few reflections on the trip, and then we'll take uh, questions on that, and then domestic questions at the end. Kapoi. Well, tēnā tato. Um, just on behalf of the business delegation, reflecting uh, the positive uh, experience and the, the, the real positive elements of the delegation, I think the delegation are really pleased uh, to join uh, the Prime Minister and other ministers. I think you all understand the importance of both diplomatic and trade relationships. And so the 29 delegates, which is quite diverse, as you would see in terms of some of our traditional uh, sectors and then sort of moving towards sort of digital and gaming, uh, has, have really enjoyed uh, meeting and connecting with one another, but importantly, uh, the relationships and connections that we've made both in Beijing and importantly here in Shanghai, as you would have seen this morning, uh, with the various uh, signings and product launches. And so, um, it's been a very positive vibe, uh, and it's been wonderful to be part of the delegation really promoting Aotearoa New Zealand as one, and I think it's been a real success. Jamie, you've been on a number of these trips before. How do you rate this one in terms of, I guess, what you've got out of it and just how it's sort of gone in the program compared to others? I think the context of this uh, delegation being uh, the first major delegation post-COVID is very important, and that's certainly uh, the feedback from the delegates in terms of the importance of not only the diplomatic uh, engagement that Prime Minister and Ministers have had, and the fact that you know the Prime Minister has had access to the top three in China is very important for business and economic relationships, and certainly the feedback from our customers and those that we've engaged with in China and continue to engage with, um, they've been very positive about the fact that the Prime Minister and the delegation as a whole has had that level of access. So I think that really positions our New Zealand business uh, well. Jane, what advantages do you think we had from being the first Western country to be here I think it really just demonstrates the long-standing relationship that New Zealand has had with China. And I think, you know, we know the four firsts in terms of the last 51 years. Um, and again, I think this is just a further demonstration and manifestation of the positive relationship that we have, both politically and also from a trade standpoint. Oh, most definitely. Uh, I think, you know, we probably don't in New Zealand, uh, or even yourselves as media, um, understand the level of coverage that we're getting on the various Chinese platforms. I know from a tourism standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, some of the, la the launch we had yesterday, uh, Te Whanau Apanui have had a huge impact in terms of what they did on the Great Wall, um, and that's going viral around China. And so what it does is it brings New Zealand to the forefront you know, of this vast country, which has multiple aspects in terms, in terms of its market. Um, and then I think just having ministers and the Prime Minister alongside many of our companies this morning with launches and signings, really just it lifts our profile among uh, broader Chinese consumers. What, what doors does uh, having the Prime Minister and, and senior politicians uh, open at the having it? Well, the feedback that we are getting from many of our customers is it's very important. I think if we look at the context of China in terms of uh, the view that the Chinese citizens have of diplomatic and political relationships uh, is very high. And so I think, you know, we are, we are sort of blessed and very grateful that uh, the Prime Minister has taken the time to invite such a large delegation because I think that's one of the other aspects. It's, it's sort of un unprecedented in terms of the number of companies and number of people. And I think the diversity, bringing that cultural element uh, which has uh, been wonderful too, uh, particularly with the VIP dinners. So I think, you know, it's, it's just been uh, very positive all around. Sorry, one of the um, aims was to boost trade, diversify trade away from maybe some of the more traditional exports. What signals 
um, any breakthroughs for any of the companies over here in terms of that training business? I think one of the key aspects in terms of re-engaging post-COVID, one of the objectives for the delegation was to really understand what have been some of the shifts and the consumer trends. And I think over the first couple of days in Beijing, various presentations, it was, it's been really interesting to understand what some of those mega trends are in terms of uh, consumer preferences in China. Uh, you know, we've learnt about the emerging singles market. I don't know many, if many of you are single, but there's 93 million singles. Um, in China, uh, they've talked about the emergence of uh, greater trust in Chinese brands. Sorry, can I bring you back to the singles market? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, so a part of this for the delegation is, you know, getting access to information and being able to engage at a level to give deeper understanding because, as you know, we're very reliant on the China market at the moment in terms of our two way trade. Uh, but I think you know a big part of the focus of the delegation is to really get those insights um, to understand what are some of these shifts and what do we need to be thinking about to ensure that we have resilient businesses so moving are you forward. Target markets, identifying specific target markets by actually being here on the ground. Most definitely. So I think you know the broader sort of New Zealand segment and what the various product segments are. But each business will determine what's appropriate for them. And I think you know you can't beat being on the ground, engaging with customers. Uh, learning about sort of consumers to understand what we need to be doing to ensure our viability moving forward. Prime Minister, the business delegation learned about how the economy here has been affected by post-COVID in terms of our exports. Well, what we have seen is that, of course, the slowdown in terms of the projected forecast growth uh, for China. But when we think about that, that they're still adding uh, the equivalent of the Indonesian economy per year, and recognising that New Zealand we produce enough food and fibre for 44 million people. And so when you look at the broader population of China and despite the sort of birth rates and all of those sorts of things, you know, there's sufficient consumers for our, for our products, which are premium, and we've got to continue to focus on being able to capture that premium given, you know, the, the nature of what we provide. Is there a consensus in the you know, business delegation about what the business environment is like in China? Like, is it still <laughs> as easy to do? business here or as it was 10 years ago? Well, it's very different, right? So if we think about when I first came to China a couple of decades ago, uh, there's been a huge shift in terms of sophistication. So we've, talk, we've, we've heard about you know, the digital literacy of Chinese consumers and ensuring that what we do um, takes advantage of, of some of those, uh, the, the evolution of that digital sort of shift. But I think more broadly, globally at the moment, you know, the economic conditions are still challenging and China is no different. And we see that in the forecast growth rate. So I think, again, it's challenging, um, but I think just getting that insight and being able to leverage off the, um, the prime minister and the diplomatic relationships actually positions us quite well. And the feedback from many of the VIPs at the two dinners we've had, um, they're just delighted to be able to shake hands and have a photo with the Prime Minister. Um, and that's really helpful for us. Prime Minister, is there a business delegation about the, the importance of diversifying away from China sometimes? Or has the focus been on growing in China still? Well, definitely the focus is on strengthening uh, the trade that we have with China currently. Uh, there are businesses within the delegation that are looking to grow uh, their market share in China and sort of and further develop opportunities in China, and there are others that you know will determine about what's appropriate for them in terms of diversification. Prime Minister, was there anything in this trip that surprised you? Uh, it's it's been a um, it's been a great trip. I think one of the things that I've been really heartened by is the feedback from the New Zealand business leaders who have joined me on the trip. Um, the feedback that they feel like they've been um, knocking on open doors. Um, they feel like the relationship is in a good space and they've been able to capitalise on that um, during their visit here to China. Uh, a lot of opportunities will flow now from the follow-up work that's done um, once people get back home again. Uh, we have the opportunity to connect a lot of our New Zealand delegation with people working here on the ground on our behalf um, to keep those relationships alive and expanding. Um, there is a huge market here for New Zealand products and services. And uh, so I think for, for me, you know, one of the, the big insights was, you know, the, the door is wide open. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate it? Uh, I've never really kind of given it numbers, but it'd certainly be a, a high number. Um, has the, with the um, presentations today at the lunch, you know, from the um, businesses working in China, some of that resonates with New Zealand businesses in terms of the regulatory 
you know, struggles, I suppose, or barriers with visa processing? And is that something that you would really be expecting the government to be looking at? I think one of the benefits of uh, spending time together as a delegation, you know, we're able to have various conversations both about what some of those challenges, barriers and opportunities are. And certainly talking with uh, ministers, I think, you know, it's really about getting that insight again. Um, and I know we've got a session after this where we'll pull together some of the learnings and what we can do differently uh, when we head home. But yes, uh, visa, visa issues, visas have been issues in the past, but I think what I'm heartened by um, as the head of the business delegation is our folk are wanting to find solutions and sort of sort these things out. And Prime Minister, is that something you can take home? I mean, these are pretty practical things. Um, and are you, I suppose, more aware of some of the difficulties that they have caused by being on a trip like this? We've been well aware of the visa issues for some time. We knew it was going to be a bit of a bumpy road when we reopened the border and had this huge backlog to work our way through, particularly in areas such as international student visas, for example, which can be quite time consuming to process because there's a lot more in them in terms of the information that needs to be considered. Um, as I've indicated, uh, the timeliness around international student visa applications is looking pretty good. Uh, the timeliness around business visas is improving. Uh, the timeliness around visitor visas remains a challenging area for us because there's a high volume of them and, and they obviously um, the, the frequency with which those are, are flooding in um, continues to put the system under pressure. But, but we are, you know, I'm sorry, leaving open the option, you know, if, if, we, if we need to pull more resource in. We've looked around the broader public service, for example. There are some, there are some quite technical aspects to it. So the identity verification, for example, is one of the uh, causes of, um, uh, of some of the delay. There's there's not a lot of identity verification capacity within the broader public service that we can pull out and put into that space. So, but we are looking with the DIA who process passports and also have identity verification people. They, you know, we want visitors, we want tourism, we want business, and then you kind of hit this roadblock at, at, at bureaucracy level. Yeah, so certainly we're working hard to try and speed that up, though. Prime Minister, what are your first thoughts on us being the first Western country to visit post-pandemic? And what does that I think it says that our relationship with China is in good heart. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for New Zealand businesses to get on the ground here. Many of the businesses on the delegation have actually been up here on the ground since borders reopened, but being able to take part in a, in a high level delegation like this opens up opportunities that they wouldn't have had access to post COVID-19 so far. So um, very, very positive feedback from them. Um, look, I, I, that's a, ultimately not a question for us. Um, we've been ready and, and keen and enthusiastic about coming to China. Um, as I indicated when I became Prime Minister, it was one of my foreign policy priorities was to get back up here now that the borders on both sides have reopened. This comes at a trick in a time between the US and China. How have you navigated that tightrope on this trip? The same way we always have navigated this over the 50 years of our relationship with China. Um, which is to be open, uh, to be candid, uh, to be transparent, and, and to be consistent in our position, which is what we've done. Are we being like a snowplow, if you like, going ahead so that other Western countries can follow behind us when it comes to that business interaction with China? Well, I'm sure that there'll be other countries visiting China shortly. Um, we, we welcome that as well. Um, we believe in a, you know, a, a good, robust international trading system, and China, as a very large economy, is a very important part of that. Um, I'm not unlikely to visit, it's, the travel logistics have meant that it's unlikely that I'll be able to do that during my visit to Europe next week, a week after next, sorry. Um, I'm certainly not ruling it out. It is quite a significant time commitment, it takes several days, um, and obviously I'm doing quite a lot of international travel at the moment. Um, and so add, adding that in, in addition to the fact that I'm already taking a week out to be in Europe, uh, at this point um, I, I wasn't able to do that. Um, I've had regular engagement uh, with uh, leadership from Ukraine since I became Prime Minister to convey our support for their cause. Um, I have raised their cause whilst I've been here in China. Um, New Zealand will continue to do that. Every, every other Western leader has made time in their schedule to go over there and see the atrocities in person. Why won't you do it? Um, as I've indicated, it just isn't a logistical option for me. The logistics of that make it too difficult. But Australia can do it. 
do it? Those are decisions for them. Is there any likelihood? So obviously not likely, but you might do it. Next week um, I, it, it, as, I, as I've indicated, it's not currently part of the program. Just some questions from our civic team. Um, what is your position on China being more assertive about its influence in the Pacific, and how do you see that in the context of that, that region and the US and China? Just give some context around Sorry, run that one and pass oh, me again. So, yeah. um, how do you see China's actions in the Pacific um, in terms of, I suppose, that broader geostrategic battle and us as a Pacific region? I mean, where do we sit in all of that? Yeah. New Zealand's position on um, other countries' involvement in the Pacific, again, is an open and transparent one. Um, we recognise that the Pacific nations are independent countries in their own right, and they're entitled to have international relations as they see fit. Our role, or our goal, I guess, as New Zealand, um, is to be a trusted partner in the Pacific, um, a recognised uh, and if you like, first choice partner um, in terms of uh, Pacific countries' outward looking relationships. Um, and I believe that we've achieved that. Are you concerned that as the tensions between those two superpowers ramp up potentially in our backyard, in our region, that, that we get more into it? Um, Obviously, we believe as a country that you know, diplo diplomacy, um, ongoing, open, honest, candid dialogue is the way to resolve tension and the way to resolve issues. That's New Zealand's commitment. That's what we've been doing. It's what we'll continue to do. How many expectations of, um, I suppose, where the Pacific Islands you know, would, would lie if, if it came down to, for example, a conflict between the US and China? Um, ultimately, that's a matter for each of those individual countries. They are independent countries. They're entitled to form their own views. Um, we welcome increased interest in the Pacific. Uh, the fact that the US have had more of a presence in the Pacific in recent times, that is something that New Zealand has also welcomed. So, um, but, you know, those countries make their own course. Mr. Jamie, could you, could you talk a little bit, uh, because in the survey showed that this were pretty concerned about that geopolitical risk was one of the, one of the risks that came through in the survey. Could you talk a little bit about whether this trip had um, most definitely, I think you know part of the delegation. We have our largest exporting um, companies as part of the delegation, which I think in itself recognises the importance of the political and diplomatic relationship between New Zealand and China. And and all I can say, the feedback from everyone has been it's been a great success, and the nature of the conversations uh, that have been had. Uh, warm and constructive um, have been such where actually it's it's positioned us well as a as a country and you know as businesses to continue to to grow trade and uh, to work constructively with our customers and market. Do you think China's been, been we're communicating to China that we're not an adversary as um, some of the leadership that you said and partners not adversary? Do you think we have communicated that? All I can say is, you know, my understanding and my engagements, uh, being a participant on many delegations and our own business exchange here in China has been one that everyone has reflected uh, the relationship that New Zealand has had with China, which has been long-standing. Um, you know, references to the work of Rewi Ali and others in terms of cr providing that foundation for our country, but ultimately for our businesses to thrive and succeed in what is a very challenging market. But I think when you look at what our businesses are doing here relative to um, others from other countries. I think we do punch above our weight. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Just last couple of questions on the international. I'm not aware at the moment, but uh, Taiwan is another market for a number of our businesses and you know there's already work going on uh, between New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and various businesses back home. Okay. Um, uh, it's not not something that's currently on the cards. Okay. Th thanks, Jamie. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, as I've indicated, these are um, not issues that have been raised formally through the system, so there haven't been formal complaints. They relate to some time ago. I wasn't the Prime Minister at that time. The advice that I've had from uh, the senior public servants uh, involved, so the chief executives who have those employment relationships, is that they are satisfied that the matters were resolved at the time. 
I, I've made it very, I've made it very clear to all of my ministers um, uh, in, the t in the entire time that I've been the Prime Minister uh, that I expect them to treat public service servants with respect, um, that I expect relationships to be cordial, that I expect them to set high standards of the New Zealand public service, uh, and that I absolutely expect them to make sure those, sta those high standards are achieved. Um, but that doesn't mean that relationships can't be characterised by respect. I believe that they can be. She said yesterday that she didn't yell, she'd never yelled at a staff member. Has she lied? It was very difficult to form judgments on anonymous complaints because there's no ability to investigate them or to, uh, to look at the facts behind them. So therefore I have to work on the feedback that I've had from the chief executive level, um, which is that they are satisfied that any issues were resolved at the time uh, that they were raised. Doesn't that point to a why? Jessica. Um, chief executives of government departments are the appropriate place for any staff members in a government department to raise any concerns about any of the working relationships that they have, including with ministers. Well, if, if there are serious concerns and the chief executive um, wants to take those further, then the appropriate course of action is to then raise them with the prime minister. That's, that's in the job description. Uh, if not with the prime minister, then either with the head of the department of prime minister and cabinet or with the public service commissioner. Uh, in this case, neither of those things have happened. Disadvantage when a relationship broke down. Has that changed? And coming back to Jesus' question, I mean, you're hinging very heavily on that formal complaint, but not everyone is going to come and, and feel that that's okay for them to do. The public service and the parliament and the government have put in place a number of new systems that weren't in place prior to the Debbie Francis report, so that there are now proper processes to deal with issues such as this when they arise. So if uh, a public servant um, has a bad interaction with a minister, for example, that's not necessarily evidence of bullying. It could be an ev evidence of the fact that someone's made a mistake and there, there is actually a problem that um, a minister has complained about and that it is a legitimate um, complaint for them to have made. That's why those processes are very important, because those issues can be resolved. The feedback that I've had from the chief executives concerned is that they were confident that the issues were resolved at, at the time. As I've, as, well, as I've indicated, I've made my expectation clear, and I did it, I think, in the first Cabinet meeting that I had after I became Prime Minister, that it's my expectation that all public servants, all staff working in ministers' offices, uh, will be treated with so respect so and with dignity. So these, are these are historic uh, allegations. Very hard to investigate historic um, accusations when, um, when they're anonymous. But if that was, if someone over the phone, the same person, to the degree that their colleagues can hear them, do you find that acceptable? I mean, is that something that, that you would say, oh, yeah, that's okay for a minister to do? Um, it depends on the volume of the phone. Um, the, really? some, people, well, some people have their phones turned up quite loud. I, I can hear conversations of people sitting uh, on other sides of a, a car. The phone, so, the, 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 but the, the issue is here, it's impossible to form judgments on those without knowing the details of that. I do expect um, that ministers will set high um, standards for the public service and high expectations. Uh, and their job as ministers is to make sure that New Zealanders are getting the services and the responsiveness out of the public services that they pay for. And, 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 the, and on occasion, that will involve ministers giving feedback to the public service that they haven't met the expectations set of them. Oh, no, I have that. Well, that, those are not the words that I have used. So, uh, don't. What I've, what I have, what I have, what I have said, um, is that I have made inquiries about it. Um, that the relevant chief executives have indicated to me that they were satisfied that those issues were resolved at the time. Um, there haven't been any further complaints or any formal complaints uh, that anyone has raised with me or, um, or that they have raised with me that have been raised with them. Um, so I accept them at their word on that. Jenna. Sorry? 
Um, we've had some uh, conversations, particularly in the last few weeks, about the fact that um, Kitty has needed to take some time off. That's a matter of public record. That's something that Kitty has put on the public have record. You, have any of your ministers raised concerns about Kitty Allen's behaviour at the start of the year? Um, when ministers take time off, obviously our senior ministers will have a conversation about that. That's not Why aren't you answering asking. the question? She's, she's taking, she's taking time off. I don't, discuss, I don't discuss staffing matters publicly. The Prime Minister's made our point very clear. Did you raise it with the Prime Minister? I've had no reason to raise anything with the Prime Minister on that matter. So no, you didn't? Joke. I said I haven't. Um, the two main defences that Kitty Allen has provided um, are that Parliament is a robust working place and that, quote, we do things differently in the regions. Those sorts of things are specifically what the Debbie Francis review kind of looked at as kind of behaviour and just unacceptable excuses for just how the, the environment works at Parliament. I mean, are you concerned or surprised or disappointed that those are the defences she's using still when the Deputy France report has pointed out specifically that that kind of stuff isn't acceptable? I've, I've made my expectations of all ministers very clear uh, around the sorts of relationships that I want them to have internally and externally. Uh, that involves treating everybody with respect. I've, uh, I was raised uh, on the notion that you treat other people as you yourself would want to be treated, and that's my expectation yeah, of ministers I mean, as sorry, well. Just a, 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 that answers a completely different question. She's used those two things as the defence this week, like 48 hours ago, 24 hours ago. So are you, do you believe that those defences saying, oh, we do things differently in the regions, or oh, Parliament's just a robust working place, is that actually an acceptable thing to be saying as a defence for that? Parliament is a robust place. Um, the job that we do is a difficult job, and the importance of accountability will make people feel uncomfortable from time to time. That's the nature of a democratic system of government. That's not an excuse for treating people poorly, though. Um, and I have made it very clear uh, to all of my ministers that I expect them to so treat people with respect. That you don't think that those responses are actually an acceptable defence either? I haven't had a conversation with her since... Uh, since I've, I haven't seen those comments, so I haven't had a conversation with her about them. Luke? You keep, um, you, know, you keep talking about you know, ministers having high standards, you know, expecting high standards of public service. The kind of sense of what you're missing is what you really mean that sometimes public service needs a bit of a rocket lit up under them, and that's kind of... You know, and, yeah, and there'll be robust conversations if... You know, something isn't delivered, or you know, they're not carrying out the government's will. That is the nature of the job of a minister. The job of a minister is to make sure the public service is delivering the, on the expectations of the government, which ultimately reflect the expectations of New Zealand citizens who pay their taxes in order to get public services. Um, so from time to time, the public service won't deliver. There will be difficult conversations uh, on occasion where uh, where expectations aren't being met. That's the nature of being a minister. And sometimes the people on the receiving end of that won't like it. They won't feel comfortable about it. You can still have those conversations treating people with respect though. Can I give you a clear answer? Sorry, you were, you were talking before when I asked if any ministers had raised it with you about Kitty Allen taking leave. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, did any of your ministers ever raise concerns about Kitty Allen's behaviour towards staff? Um, as I've indicated, ministers will discuss uh, their relationships with other ministers with me all of the time. Um, I'm confident that our cabinet has a good, cohesive working relationship, and I'm not going to relay the details of every conversation that I have with ministers about other ministers. Well, that's the answer that you're getting. Um, yes, Thomas. With you. As I've indicated, I'm not going to relay every conversation that I have with ministers it publicly. Very much like you Thomas. Still Prime Minister, you're Nash, you're you're back Michael Wood, you're back in Kitty Ellen. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that you're going to end up in the same position this time as you did the last two times? Um, as I've indicated, um, I can deal with complaints that are made. I can deal with actual issues. These are issues that occurred before I was Prime Minister. Uh, the feedback that I've had is that they were resolved at the time. Surely you must be worried that you know, you'll be sitting in a hotel room in Europe dealing with the fact that one of your ministers is imploding again. Uh, look, I, I deal with issues as they arise. Is this, they just seem to be arising very frequently. Is, 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 this, is your sense, though, that there is more to come on this? I mean, I know you can only deal with what you've got in front of you, and if you don't have formal complaints, it's difficult. But is your sense that this is snowballing? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I deal with issues as they arise. OK. Yeah. Thank so you, everybody. about the fuel taxes yeah. coming on? Yes. Um, I mean, What's your message to Kiwis who wake up um, having to pay more to fill the tank? 
Um, I acknowledge that um, no increase in costs for anything is welcome um, for New Zealanders. We've increased the fuel tax subsidies for quite an extended period of time. Petrol prices are now back down significantly lower than they were when we introduced the subsidy in the first place. I acknowledge that the, uh, that the resumption of fuel tax, won't, you know, that, that addition um, of fuel tax won't be welcome um, for Kiwi households filling up the tank, but it is money that we need in order to maintain the roads, to build the roads and so on. Um, and so uh, we've, we've, through the budget, looked at other more targeted cost of living measures and there's a, a range of those that we've put in, in place. Few weeks, have you ever once considered it, again? Um, it is a very expensive policy. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 It, it is a very expensive policy. Um, we've continued it for as long as we can financially. Ultimately, when we extend the fuel tax subsidy, we need to find that funding from elsewhere. We've certainly been, um, you know, shaking the tin in terms of getting extra money out to keep that policy going. Uh, but the fuel tax did, did need to come back on at some point. Just to follow up on that, do you appreciate? We introduced the fuel tax subsidy at a time when petrol prices were significantly higher than they are now. Petrol prices have come down again. There's never going to be an ideal time to put the petrol, um, you know, the full extent of the petrol taxes back on again. Um, and I acknowledge that that's unwelcome for Kiwi families. But I think what New Zealand families should also take comfort from is the fact that we are seeing inflation now trending back down in the right direction. We are very, very focused as a government on getting inflation back into that target range because that is how Kiwi families will get ahead and see their you know, effective purchasing power not continuing to erode in the way that it has over the last year or two. That comment you made about the fine volume, is that consistent with the situation? No. What do you um, think um, the petrol tax reduction achieved in your analysis? The, yeah. It provided some cost of living relief um, to New Zealanders at a time when uh, you know, petrol prices were at record highs <laughs> Um, and you know, inflation was also um, inc actually increasing at that time. We're in a different environment now. Petrol prices have come back down again, um, and inflation is now trending down as well. Are you trying to undermine the accountability? Sorry, was that? Are you trying to undermine the accountability? No. No. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.